the CFO days by Avacom. Uh, we are super thrilled to be hosting you today. I'm Claudio Martinez, your host, CEO, and co-founder of Avacom. We've been waiting for this session for a long while. I cannot be more thrilled to be uh, having this dream um, uh, guests and, and speakers with us today to share you know, how they think of the archetypes of the modern CFO and how they are um, seeing the market evolving in the CFO office. Very briefly, I'm going to mention them, but then we'll go for a warm-up session, a warm-up question, um, so that they share more of their experience and you'll have a 45 minutes ahead of you uh, of uh, amazing content. We have with us John Watkins, uh, founder and CEO of Altima, Bill Morris, CFO at Genesis Global, and Michael Bannon, President and CFO at Typhor. So without further delay, let me kick off with this warm-up question. The journey to the CFO office is very different from um, everyone, and we have you know, a, you know, clear examples here. I love that you guys share with the audience how your backgrounds shape your path to becoming a successful CFO, serial in some cases. And you know, what were the key experiences that you accumulated that uh, prepare you for, for this role? Uh, Michael, let me kick off with you. Um, this is the third time you're operating as a CFO um, after more than a decade as an investor. So when did you realize that it was time to make the move? And, and generally, you know, uh, what's the story behind your, your current position? Yeah. Um, well, thank you for having me. Um, so let's see. So as, as you said, you know, I started my career in banking and in investing. And I think, you know, when I set out and, and, and began my career, the intention was never to do that for the entirety of it. I think it turns out to be a very interesting space to be in. And so I learned a lot along the way. But one of the things I did is I, I really tried to think about what part of the job or parts of the job of investing I enjoyed the most. And in conversations with people, I, I typically find that folks enjoy different parts of the job. So some people love being out there and sourcing new deals. Some people love structuring what the financing will look like. I realized about myself that the part I, I enjoyed most was getting to sit down with the companies that we invested in and sit with the management teams and think about how to grow and how to build and how to do all the things that you know we now in our current operating roles get to do. And I figured if that was the part that I enjoyed, that's what I should go out and do. And so I was very intentional about making the move where I said, that is, that is what I want to go be a part of. I, I realized that I wanted to help go build and grow something and I wanted to feel like I was having an impact doing so. And so again, I tried to be pretty intentional and I went out and I joined a very early stage company to start because one of the things I felt in making the transition to the CFO seat, having not been an operator before, was I really wanted to see how it worked from the ground up. I really wanted to see what it was to, to choose your ERP figure out how you, 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 know, you were going to invoice customers, think about how you wanted to run payroll, all those sorts of foundational elements to the CFO role. And so you know, now, as you mentioned, I'm in my third seat doing this. I'm having a blast doing it. But I think in making that transition for me, being very purposeful about going early, going foundational, has allowed me to continue to scale with companies as I've continued to grow professionally. Thank you for sharing, Michael. I'm feeling you had the soul of an operator and a builder, and you decided to go and start your CFO operational career early stage. That's great advice for the audience, right? So start early, learn to build those foundations, and then you know move up if, if you want later. Billy, you have an impressive track record in Silicon Valley, and then you relocated to Ireland and joined Genesis Global as their CFO. And that's quite a story and what a journey, right? Uh, can, can you share more of that uh, with us, please? Yeah, absolutely. And, and thanks also for, for the time and, and for, for involving me. Um, I, I moved to the US in 2009, first to the Midwest for a couple of years, and then out to San Francisco in 2011. Um, and I was there for about 10 years across three different companies. Um, I'd, I'd wanted to move out to California and San Francisco in particular 
um, just to gain more experience in the tech space. Um, my, my prior background was corporate banking. I was in Deloitte, uh, chartered accountant, uh, did m and private equity, due diligence, valuations. Uh, I was in their corporate finance practice. So quite a bit on the, on the practice side um, and was quite excited to get into more of an operating role similar to, to Michael, but um, you know, wanted to purposefully go into the, the tax sector and, and obviously wanted to do that in San Francisco. So I joined Ubisoft in 2011 um, in their FDNA team and um, it, it, they had a newly established center for their global um, management of their Facebook and online gaming division. Um, it was a fascinate, fascinating time. They were rivaling um, Zynga at the time, uh, so it was, it was quite a bit ago. Um, but the, the, you know, the model was very much a usage-based or user-based model, MAUs, DAUs. Um, ARPU conversion rates, you know, the full funnel economics, um, really strong focus on, on unit economics. Um, and so the, um, uh, you know, core focus was around financial modeling and, and getting a good grasp on that side. Um, great uh, cultural shift from corporate banking in the Midwest to a video game and, uh, company in, in San Francisco. Really enjoyed it, um, but wanted to move into a, an earlier stage startup um, and started to do some research in some of the top tier VC backed companies in the Bay Area um, with the likes of Andreessen, Bessemer, Sequoia. Um, I came across an opportunity with Twilio um, in 2014 as their first FPA hire. Um, and it was my first VC backed uh, company. So, qu- quite an early stage. There were a Series D at the time, about 220, 230 people. Um, uh, they were just scaling up and, and, and building their, their internal team. Um, they were also usage or consumption based. Um, so interesting um, challenge to uh, uh, analyze, forecast and predict their um, sort of metrics and, 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 um, uh, and drive some of their metrics to, to, to look at their, their growth model. Um, so it's a great, great seat to, to sit in from the FP&A side. Um, We drove our Series E uh, in uh, 2015 with Fidelity and T. Rowe, so uh, a strong institutional round, which really drove um, good internal processes for for pre-IPO prep. Um, We IPO'd in 2016 and and then did a follow-on offering uh, about six months after the IPO. So a lot of fundraising over the course of a short period. Um, It was an incredible seat to sit in 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 FP&A, and um, really got sort of a front row experience in, you know, all facets around fundraising and um, and the IPO process from banker selection, S1 drafting, business metrics development, et cetera. I was on the first four earnings calls with the executive team. So really phenomenal experience. And it was, you know, right place, right time. And, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of work, but it was it was an incredible experience, probably 10 years worth of work in, in four years. Um, um, but yeah, also was uh, involved on the accounting side, equity, legal, uh, international expansion. So it was really, you know, fr- from the FPNIC, got to see a lot of the business and there aren't all the experts in the seats yet. And so you just tend to get pulled into, you know, really interesting initiatives. Um, so over the, the course of um, just under four years, uh, the company had scaled quite dramatically. I think it was about 10x in top line. 5x in operations um, and decided to, to move into a, a, an earlier stage company again with Series C, um, Sequoia backed a company called Thousand Eyes, uh, which was in the network intelligence space. Um, and I was there for about four and a half years, you know, similar incredible journey of, of scaling, um, you know, and, and re- really a, a amazing time to be in, in, a, in a journey with, with a scale up, um, helped to build the um, the foundations of the FP&A and finance team, uh, again, got pulled into accounting, equity operations, facilities, uh, international expansion, you know, just across a number of different um, assets. And it was much more of a, a traditional enterprise B2B uh, SaaS bookings based model. So uh, quite a contrast to the Twilio economic model in the early days. Um, I also got quite actively involved in uh, supporting the commercial side of the business and oversaw deal desk. And I think that interlock between finance and sales was really incredible, great experience. 
Um, we entered partnership um, uh, discussions with AppDynamics, uh, who were previously acquired by Cisco. That discussion evolved into an M&A discussion um, in 2021, um, and we closed the deal mid-21 um, uh, remotely under, under COVID. Um, so we went through that DD pre and post acquisition process um, with Cisco, which was uh, quite, quite a lengthy process and they most definitely run you through the ringer, but um, a phenomenal experience to come out the, the, the other side. Um, and so I committed a year post the acquisition um, to help the integration um, and migrated my role back to, to Ireland um, and then wrapped with them about six months later and joined Genesis. What a journey. And, and I'm, I'm, I love to see how FPNA really accelerated your, your career after your time in banking, but also FPNA as a privileged pr perspective, you know, and a position to, to accelerate your path into, into CFO. Um, John, looking at you now, and, and obviously you have like this amazing uh, perspective on, you know, and, and access to many, many CFOs and, and looking at the paths that Michael and Billy have shared now and comparing that with the thousands of CFOs you've met over the years, right? What, what similarities do you see? What trends are you identifying? Yeah, it's um, it's, it's a great question. And well, firstly, thanks for uh, thanks for putting this on today. Um, I run Altima, for those of you that, that don't know. Um, we've been around now for almost 20 years, so we've been at this a long time. We're a 30-person search firm based out of London, um, and we're super, super, super focused. So all we do and all we ever have done in exclusivity is move CFOs to VC-backed tech-enabled companies in Europe and the East Coast of the US. So as you would imagine, um, we're massive advocates of this, and I think the work you're doing here is really important. But thinking about Billy and Michael, and we've got, um, I think it's what really struck me, and we obviously know the guys, but their backgrounds are actually, there's some similarities, but there's also quite a few differences. Um, and I think for us, it, it comes right back down to why we founded Ultima, why Ultima exists ultimately, because it really highlights the breadth of the role. And listening to Billy and Michael talk about what they've been up to, and, and Billy in particular in different contexts, sort of what different finance hats he needed to wear and how, what he brought to the table, different toolboxes. And it might surprise you to hear that being utter CFO advocates, we almost don't believe in the concept of a CFO. At Altima, we talk a lot about a chief everything else officer. And the fact is, all we do is support VC-backed companies. And, and founder-led companies at Series A may not have a particularly built-out leadership team. They may not have any form of finance team. They may have really loose structures in place. But for us, and this I think is where it comes into the backgrounds, really helping founders and companies understand, you know, what they need to hire for at any one given point in a company's journey is, is not a straightforward thing. And, you know, there's a bunch of confidencing factors, whether that be a rate of scale, the subsector of technology, the monetization model. Actually, in an earlier stage company, the rest of the senior leadership team and their spike skills and experience the growth journey for the next 12, 24 months, organic versus inorganic, all of these factors will start informing what size and shape a financially orientated leader a company needs. And, and I understand there's an awful lot of people listening and watching today that are aspiring CFOs. And I think the great message is that, you know, whether you're an accountant, whether you're a, a banker or you come from the banking route and investing route like Michael, or whether you're a consultant, you know, there is, there's a role for you there, right? And it's finding that context for each company. So I'm making sure you're operating within your zone of genius. So I think even though there are similarities, I think the point worth celebrating is, is their differences, right? Because they come from really different trajectories, yet are both you know, really well-performing CFOs and great companies. Well, thank you so much. And that is a nice transition into our following question. Let's double click more on the topic that we're tackling today, which is the archetypes, right? Uh, we all um, had a front row seat into the transformation of the CFO role from you know, accounting and classic controlling backgrounds to becoming the strategic business leader, right? That operational leader that is having a multiplied impact in their company, right? Um, and we are obviously great advocates from, from that transformation that is becoming a reality in the market. And, and John, uh, you perhaps better than most um, have a unique vantage point into this evolution uh, and, and the different archetypes to the modern CFO, you were highlighting now um, the variety. The, the variety is healthy. What are the classic routes and archetypes that you identify in the market? 
Yeah, it's, um, I think, well, we've identified, believe it or not, 16 archetypes of CFO. We've properly geeked out on this stuff, as you'd imagine. Um, and Billy and Michael are obviously representative of a couple. I think in terms of you talked a bit or two about the, the perception of, about the journey of the CFO seat. And, and I think it's also worthwhile thinking about that. I think when, when we started this journey as a company, you know, almost 20 years ago now, CFOs were perceived in a very different way to what they are now. You know, a CFO was, was traditionally an accountant, exclusively accountant. They were in the same way as we used to talk about children in the 1970s, they were to be seen and not heard. And they'd sit in the back office and come out and tell people they're spending too much money, et cetera, et cetera. They were really not seen in the way that they are now. I think, and the great thing for us is seeing I think with the influence of the US and US capital and US understanding coming into our ecosystem, you know, we've really seen that actually there's an acknowledgement that the CFO can come in all sorts of flavors. It's not a one size fits all. There are spikes, there is, you know, the, whether you're from a, a background of being able to articulate an equity story phenomenally well, or whether you put brilliant control frameworks in place, all of these factors mean that actually CFOs can be game changing. And I think the biggest, the biggest change arguably in the last sort of 18 months or so, has been the funding climate. And I think going from an environment where there was such a huge abundance of capital, and, and I think you know the guys, Billy and Michael, would have seen this, that being at board meetings where a lot of the conversation was around growth metrics and growth, growth, growth. Um, we've seen a situation where there's such a scarcity of capital that actually the CFO is sitting square in all of these conversations now. So now we all know that the VC model is predicated by companies growing, right? It doesn't really work without that. So, but nowadays you're having to grow in a really capital efficient manner. So every dollar that is being put into the business internally, externally, there needs to be some form of re re essentially return on investment. Um, so I think actually you know, we're in a, we're in an environment now where we've gone from a back office perception 15, 10 years ago even, to now actually CFOs are superheroes of these companies, right? And we're thinking about companies that are exclusively um, growth stage and going through. So I think that's the biggest change I've certainly witnessed and us as a firm have witnessed is just the way this role is perceived and the ability it's had to really, really create game-changing results. Super insightful. Thank you, John.